I saw Sasha. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Oh, Madeline's here. Hi, Madeline. I saw Madeline too. Let's oh, talk water because water matters. Yeah, Madeline is like into water. Matters. Cold and letter N deadly. Follow follow Madeline on Instagram and to see all these incredible matter experiments. Sasha as well. Sasha is the seaweed queen of Rhode Island <laughs> and does seaweed printing. Sashunya. Sashunya on Instagram. Everybody's... <laughs> <laughs> Sasha. <laughs> you went stunned. Like, am I in the right Zoom meeting? Wait a, minute. Wait a minute. What? You went from talking about eating plastic credit cards to the seaweed. To well, seaweed. Water printed. connects it all. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All money. right. I'm ready. And money. <laughs> Profits. People are still coming in. Just give it, give it a minute or so. Okay. I know a minute sometimes seems like a long time on Zoom when you're waiting. You know, in the broadcast world, that's like the whole show. One it's the whole minute. Show. 30 second spot. I mean, this would be like a million dollars at the Super Bowl. <laughs> we had to do a 30 second spot. It was pretty. Uh... People would be like, what just happened? Yeah. We've been having like a conversation for about. 10 minutes and so then we just hit the record button after that <laughs> and let yeah. you all in microplastics and microplastics and Credit. water quality and yeah. kathy and amy have you ever polled how many people are doing something with their hands as they listen to feedback friday i'm seeing oh i'm seeing deborah showing me knitting yeah, yeah a lot of people have not, oh oil oh. dancer Awesome. Yep. Uh -uh. We had uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me want to go grab some some yarn or All something. All right, Kate. <laughs> I just saw some yarn. During um, uh, of course the... Lisa. Of course Lisa's got her yarn. Yep. During and the pandemic, yarn wall. there was uh there were folks who were joining us from Europe and they would all have glasses of wine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> They're out of their teeth. <laughs> During the pandemic, what it was like, people were like, I think I'm going to just start drinking early. <laughs> I think I am tired it's of basically it. the weekend. It's yeah. the pandemic. It was always weekend. <laughs> I mean, we're still in it. We're post. I don't know. Let's Better. not even talk about it. Not, Let's yeah. talk about joyous things. Joyous All right. Things. Well, I think we're ready to. It's spring. You want me to play that song? I do. You're gonna count us in. I'll let people uh, in on Zoom. Sure. Right. Well, it's the end of the week. Now where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, <laughs> so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Yay. Yay. Hello, hello, <laughs> hello, everyone. Welcome to Feedback Friday, episode 117. Oh my goodness. Every time I say that number or the number preceding <laughs> or the number preceding that, I, I always gasp that, my goodness, we've done this 117 times. Um, I'm Kathy Hot Tory, president of Botanical Colors, and joining me from Cape Cod is Amy Dufo, our director of communications. And we are so pleased to have a special guest in celebration of world water life, really. Yeah, life. Um, life, uh, Crystal Moody Wood. And before we get started with that part of the presentation, 
Just a quick intro from us. Feedback Friday is our show where we talk with artists, scientists, activists, gardeners, seedsmen, seeds women, um, growers, all sorts of people who are related to the world of natural color and textiles. So if you are new to Feedback Friday, there are 117 episodes out there that you can peruse um, to see what strikes your fancy in this amazing world that we're inhabiting. Um, so just a few reminders. Uh, we are uh, launching a die kit for beginner. We're calling it a beginner die kit, but I mean, this is a full size dies that we've chosen for you and along with some instructions and support that um, you can purchase. So that's on our site. We also have um, both our dye seeds and kala cotton, which is an indigenous cotton that is grown only with rainwater. There's no irrigation, uh, organically raised and uh, indigenous to the northwestern desert area of India called Gujarat. So that's also on sale. Um, Cara Marie Piazza, who has recently joined us as a brand ambassador and also the person who's making us laugh a lot, is um, got her ice dyeing video recording workshop up and she also is offering a new workshop uh, through us about painting with natural dyes. So check that out, that's um, available. The date of it is April 15th. I don't know the time, but it's gonna, it's a Saturday. So you can hang with Cara and have fun painting. Um, and then we also have had a couple of openings in the Abu Bakar Fofana Santa Fe workshops. So if you've been hankering to go, but you found that the class was sold out, um, we did have a few spots open up. So grab those while you can. Um, so today we're welcoming sustainability consultant, Crystal Moody Wood. Um, Crystal has been a friend and um, ally for many years. We've worked together since I would say, what, 2013, 2014 on the Backyard Project, which was um, it, one of the first local uh, fiber and construction and making a garment um, kind of concepts that happen with a major brand, the North Face. And it was an incredible journey to see how that happened. And we use Sally Fox's um, cotton. It was just, I mean, I'm sure Crystal can talk about it too, much more, but it was, uh, that's where I met Crystal. And she's going to be, she's actually shifted a bit. She's now a consultant in sustainability, but she really focuses on water issues. And so she's gonna share a brief overview of the critical ocean and water impacts that are resulting from current textile and apparel systems and the way that the ways that textile leaders can address issues such as microfiber pollution, shifts from climate change, forever chemicals, and all these other things that we hear about, but we don't really have deep knowledge on what our response could be or what we should be doing as uh, informed consumers. So we're gonna follow the presentation with a discussion centered around the role of natural dyes as a solution to some of these critical issues through the lens of water. Um, Amy's gonna be our moderator and monitoring the chat once it's open and that's where you'll post your questions. So Crystal, you don't need to read the chat. Amy's gonna feed you any questions. Crystal's also gonna be asking us questions in the middle. Um, so if you hear me going, uh, it's because I'm thinking and um, <laughs> we'll have that little interchange as well. Everyone's going to be muted for the presentation but we'll open it up afterwards um, for questions and or um, hellos and the call's being recorded and we'll have a video ready later on and any additional information uh, that's with this, that's in the chat will be a sidebar in that video. So you, we don't need to send you a chat as well. So now I'm just gonna welcome Crystal. Crystal, welcome, welcome. So great to see you. And um, we're really anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm so excited to be on this side of Feedback Friday. This is such an incredible program you all have kept going. I didn't realize I was 
117. Uh, I think that was actually part of my AOL screen name back in the day, the numbers 117, because my soccer numbers were 11 and 17. So this is just so fitting. <laughs> um, I'll jump in here. Um, and I do consider you both dear friends. So I'm so excited to be here with you and your community. I love that people are doing things with their hands as we talk. Um, so I'm very excited to share with you all what I've prepared today. Oops, here we don't want to do that yet. Uh, let's see. All right, you should see uh, the full screen version of my presentation. Amy's nodding. Good. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Um, First, for today's program, I will share a little bit about myself, um, our consultancy, the critical issues we see at the intersection of textiles and water today, and then dive in deep into one of the more interesting areas of our work, or at least I feel is very interesting uh, and that we feel needs more attention. In celebration of World Water Week, Kathy, Amy, and I thought it would be fitting to host a session centered around our life source here on Earth water. Uh, as my Shiro and the great marine biologist Sylvia Earle states simply, no water, no life, no blue, no green. All living systems are deeply interconnected by water, and I'm here today to share more about how this lens has shifted the way I work in fiber and textiles. I started my career just over 15 years ago with an eye towards fashion and textiles with a knack for science, hobbies that centered around making my own clothing and thrift shopping and a deep interest in sustainability. I found myself working in corporate materials development for one of the largest global apparel and footwear conglomerates of the world, VF Corporation, and a lot of that time with the North Face brand. Uh, through my role at VF in materials development and innovation, I had the opportunity to work with some of the most advanced textile mills in the world, developing new materials, new chemistry, processes, and products with performance and sustainability as the main drivers. On paper, I had a role that should have fulfilled my wildest career dreams, but it didn't. Thankfully, while in that corporate materials development role, I had the opportunity to meet Rebecca Burgess, pictured here on the left, uh, and the amazing community she had already built around her nonprofit fiber shed together along with an epic team of people including kathy hattori and botanical colors uh, we developed the backyard hoodie displayed on the upper left uh, using color grown cotton with sally fox uh, blended with fiber from farmers in the sustainable cotton project here in california the hoodie was grown and sewn in california and 100 percent produced in the u.s something very unique, something the North Face, as far as domestic production wise, hadn't done in years or decades, um, and uh, really thoughtful around a soil to skin product. Um, through this work with Fibershed and, the, uh, and Rebecca, I began to learn the important role that natural materials and dyes have in our material future, how the lens of soil, regional production, and knowing your entire supply network uh, were key to deep environmental stewardship and textiles. But there was still a missing piece for me. And that realization came to me on a boat in the remote Indonesian islands. So still soul searching in my corporate materials role, I decided to join a plastic pollution research expedition hosted by the nonprofit Five Gyres, knowing that microfiber pollution would be challenging to see firsthand because it's so small um, and we'd, the equipment on board would not be able to see it. I decided to join the sale to better understand plastic pollution as a whole. Um, and it was an incredible experience, you know, through starting to understand the role that natural fiber and natural dyes have, and now going out to the, some of the most remote islands in the world, um, seeing the impacts that we have, that human waste and human plastic pollution have, um, footwear uh, floating up onto remote islands where no one exists, um, you know, um, foam sandals or Nike shoes. Um, also finding things like this, this textile debris. I ended up being the sort of footwear and 
apparel uh, anointed person on board. So anytime anyone found something, they came and brought it to me. Um, this was a piece of debris that was um, intertwined in the mangroves of a remote island that uh, someone retrieved while kayaking uh, from our, our boat that we were using. Um, and what you see here is a synthetic label actually saying 100% cotton uh, with a gray synthetic thread attached. Staring at this debris, I realized that the cotton had degraded away and the sewing thread um, was left there to find these persistent materials still available for us to find a skeleton of probably a cotton t-shirt. Um, you know, and it was then that it really started to just open a lot of different questions in my mind, thinking about uh, single materials. Here's this cotton t-shirt, but we're using synthetic materials on tags and, and how we compose and, and put together this piece of clothing. Um, what was happening with those dyed cotton fibers? Um, they were not attached anymore to this particular piece of debris, but where were they? What, what impacts are they having? Um, so microfiber pollution, we know, isn't the only issue that our oceans are facing. Um, it is really the design of the whole textile and product system. So with that, um, with that inspiration, I, I soon after decided to leave my corporate job in materials development and start my own company, a sustainable textiles consultancy that works with leaders across multiple sectors and to build regenerative systems through the lens of soil, sea, and circularity. At Materievolve, uh, we envision a materials world that stewards the health and wealth of all living systems, a world where science and creativity are in balance and we can wear textiles that match our values. Through the water lens, I found an ocean conservation consultant willing to dig deep with me at the intersection of textiles and ocean. I see her here today. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> Um, she has 20 years of ocean conservation experience, 10 years in plastic pollution specifically, and has planned over 10 ocean expeditions. Carolyn has been instrumental in bringing the ocean and water lens to our work at Materievolve, and uh, together we've been able to build an amazing community and body of work at this intersection and look forward to continuing to grow that effort. Our three main services include sustainable textile consulting directly with clients, uh, a wide range of clientele, providing expertise, project management, technical writing, creative ideas to address each client's needs, building experiential learning programming and educational speaking or science communications. Uh, we work with a wide range of clientele from industry brand leaders, sustainable manufacturers, materials innovators, farmers, fiber and dye producers, NGOs and government agencies. We believe that designing for a blue material world takes a cross-sector effort and a variety of key stakeholders. So through the lens of water, we see and we address these critical issues through our work. First of all, our ocean chemistry is shifting. Uh, it's threatening finite and fragile marine life, as well as food security and livelihoods of our global communities dependent on these marine ecosystems to live. Um, with global warming and excess CO2 in our atmosphere, we see major shifts in ocean health, causing uh, a phenomenon called ocean acidification. The ocean is an important carbon sink already, a place where carbon is stored and exchanged wherever air and water meet. The ocean absorbs CO2 naturally and marine organisms breathe oxygen and give off CO2 just like we do. So with CO2 concentrations higher than they've ever been in the past 800,000 years and climbing fast, ocean chemistry is shifting at an alarming rate. Um, the IPCC just launched their latest report um, with huge red flags that we really need to move right now um, or really suffer uh, a terrible fate. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation projects that the fashion industry will actually account for at least 25% of the world's carbon budget by 2050. So the textile industry is not moving fast enough and, and we really need to. So a lot of our work does center around carbon. Um, current textile systems are also heavily reliant on water from the irrigation and feeding of plants to fossil carbon extraction. Water is used in pulling fossil fuels for our fossil derived materials like polyester. Um, 
to textile processing, to shipping, water is a critical and necessary element in many stages of our textile system today. We see industry-derived pollution in many different forms. Uh, the areas we work in are discharge of hazardous chemistry, microfiber pollution, looking at packaging waste and packaging alternatives, harmful solvents that are used and material processing to create new human-made materials, uh, and discarded garments shipped to places in the world that are burned or buried or piled to degrade slowly in a location with lesser standards than where the garment ended its life. Um, there's quite a bit of industry derived pollution and, and we know a lot about it today. Um, we also see forever chemical use, uh, even with the overwhelming research to show that shows human and, and marine health impacts, uh, cancer, biopersistence, hormone disruption, forever chemicals like PFAS, which are typically used as stain and water repellents in textiles, are being used across the globe still and across many textile applications from rain jackets to carpets to furniture and more. Thankfully, we are seeing European legislation and now recently state legislations like here in California implementing bans through policy, but we still have a long way to go before these chemicals are removed from our products and processes. So educating yourself and, and knowing about um, PFAS and flame retardants and these common chemistries are really important. Uh, we also still have a very, a linear economy, non-circular textile and product systems. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation states that over 100 billion items of clothing are produced each year. We're only a population of 8 billion people, not even 8 billion people yet. So where are all those extra garments going with a linear economy? Um, our blue planet is inherently designed as a closed loop, so why are we not designing with this in mind? Finally, one of the most critical issues we think and we see through our work is the translation between sectors. For example, marine scientists are researching toxicity of microfibers without a textile scientist to help them understand what is actually used or our best practices for industry. Governments are dra drafting legislation without an understanding of how textile processes or industry works. Brands are developing products for ocean health or in the name of ocean health without a real marine or environmental scientist at the table. It is because of this we see things like recycled polyester from plastic bottles incorporated in clothing that is supposedly ocean healthy or helping oceans. Um, this sort of separation and, and not holistic thinking is, is getting us into places where we're not really actually getting to the solution. So we can design better, more holistic and more thoughtful solutions through the lens of water when we work together cross sector. The one critical water issue I really wanted to dig into today, Amy and I were talking about it and, and she suggested this, I, I thought microfiber pollution could be where we could really dig deep. Um, this is an area that Materia Evolve has been working in for many years now and, and we're really seen as, as world experts at this point. Um, two years ago, in 2021, we were contacted by the NOAA Marine Debris Program and the Environmental Protection Agency Trash Free Waters Program to provide our expertise and multi-stakeholder coordination skills to develop and co-author this report, a report on microfiber pollution that will be presented to Congress this year. Um, uh, required by the Save Our Seas Act 2.0 back in 2020, this report is the first of its kind at a state or federal level and it is solely focused on microfibers um, it includes a proposed definition of microfiber an assessment of sources prevalence and causes uh, a recommendation for standard testing methodology to measure and estimate microfiber pollution recommendations for reducing um, microfiber pollution and then a five-year plan for federal agencies and partnership with other stakeholders for how they can lead opportunities to reduce microfiber pollution. We actually had 30 different agencies um, go through a two-part workshop to commit to um, specific actions related to microfiber pollution research, solutions, um, getting folks together, um, and we sh that, that report should be publicly available as soon as it's available for Congress this year. 
Um, through this report, we were able to work with leading scientists and microplastics and digest into an actionable report that um, can help us move solutions forward. This complex issue is helping reshape and refine the way we think about textile solutions. So why should we care? Well, first of all, microplastics are ubiquitous with fibers making up the highest category of microplastics that scientists find. Uh, here, Dr. Lisa Ertl, Director of Research of Innovation and Innovation at Five Gyres, is showing the results of a surf surface sampling demo that we conducted on our textile uh, times ocean connector sale in the San Francisco Bay last October. Uh, this month, actually, her team and a, a bunch of leading scientists published a report that detailed estimates, new estimates, that the plastic smog, as they call it in our oceans, is actually making up an estimated 171 trillion plastic particles. If gathered, this tiny plastic debris would actually weigh around 2.3 million tons. And that's already out there in our oceans and waterways today. So without urgency and without urgent industry and policy action, uh, the rate at which these microplastics enter the oceans could increase about 2.6 times uh, between now and 2040. That's not that far from now. Fibers, both synthetic and treated natural, have been found in the deepest part of the ocean and the highest mountains. Uh, they've been found in the Arctic and the Antarctic, both on land and in waterways, and we also know it's in air. Here are pictures from Dr. Monica Arenzio of the Desert Research Institute in Reno, taking samples of the very recent fresh snowpack, uh, these bomb cyclones and atm atmospheric rivers we've been getting here in California and insane amounts of snowpack. Um, she, were able, she was able to analyze samples and they're, they're, they're still looking through them, but have already identified nylon and rayon fibers in these snow samples. Um, she's quoted to say that at this point, scientists know they're going to find microplastics or microfibers. It's no longer a if, it's a yes, it's going to happen, just how much. Um, we have actually partnered with two microplastic scientists hiking the Pacific Coast Trail this summer, an organization called No Trace Trails. I recommend looking them up on Twitter or Instagram uh, to better understand the prevalence of microplastics and fibers in the most remote areas of the Pacific Coast. Um, it's a 2,600 mile trail that goes through nine different national parks, um, all in remote areas. Obviously there's hikers that are ideally packing everything out. Um, they do, and they're, they'll, they will be taking 200 soil samples along the way, working with um, an Oklahoma University to analyze those soil samples and look for microplastics. Uh, they really anticipate fibers and potentially shoe rubber are going to be the highest um, microplastics that they find in these soil samples. But we're, we are working with them to um, sort of digest the results and ultimately translate that back to industry to look at what solutions could be and, and help bring awareness um, and tangible solutions to this issue. Scientists are also finding microplastics and microfibers in a wide range of living organisms from the teeniest creatures like plankton here in the right hand corner captured by a plankton scientist in Plymouth to the largest creatures like whales and polar bears. Um, on the left is a picture from the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research that shows two tiny little pelagic crabs. Um, the blue is showing 25 millimeters, um, the, the size of these little creatures. If you can see their, their claws are in front of them and they have two little black eyes and the fibers are actually entangled around their claws. Um, so entanglement being one of, um, one of the issues that animals are facing, but also digestion and chemicals that are associated with these fibers that they're digesting um, uh, and, and other issues that, that um, these creatures are experiencing. From a human health perspective, microplastics have been found in our food and drinking water and bottled water in both adult and baby feces in our lungs. And just in the last couple of years, and I was pregnant during this time when this paper came out. So, you know, thinking about my unborn placenta and the fact that it could have microplastics in there, 
um, is, was just haunting as a first time parent. So with known chemical additives and, and plasticizers used in consumer products across the board, we should be very concerned about the ubiquity of these persistent and likely toxic materials. So what do we know about impacts? Uh, unfortunately, not a lot, um, but this landscape is changing quickly, thankfully, with awareness and interest glowing, growing globally. Um, part of this issue is due to a lack of, of standard definition and methodology for testing microfiber toxicity. We have started to work with scientists at the University of Oregon. Uh, their study is pictured here in part of this article and the Hawaii Pacific University Center for Marine Debris to develop a microfiber sample test kit for scientists. Um, both labs are studying the impact of microfibers on small marine organisms and our biggest hurdle for this project is to find funding. Um, as a note, uh, don't get too distracted by this headline. Um, the University of Oregon is looking at the impact of fibers on growth and behavior um, for a shrimp and a, a small a small fish. Um, that's the study that's highlighted here. They did see impacts with both cotton and polyester. They looked at wool as well, um, but there was definitely higher impact with the synthetic fibers. Um, so, you know, we're just starting to get this research to better understand and we're still understand we're still trying to understand whether it's mechanical or chemical so are the, is it the chemicals and the materials that are actually that the fibers are actually made of or is it just the physical presence of the fiber being there um, these are things that we need to understand better to um, ultimately come up with what those important toxicity and biodegradability criteria need to be for the best solutions um, we at Material Evolve are still loyal advocates for reinvesting in natural fiber systems as a solution for microfiber pollution. But we do agree with scientists that focusing research solely on plastic microfibers and not including the suite of treated human processed natural fibers out there in our research would potentially be missing a few things that we need to understand about toxicity and biodegradability criteria. Um, so we believe that by expanding this definition, we can actually help identify best practices and the best solutions for mechanical and chemical processes that could drive the adoption of things like natural dyes and finishes. So what do we know about pathways of microfibers? Well, generally microfibers have been seen as an ocean or waterway issue, but recent research back in 2019 from the University of Santa Barbara, um, is, it helped to un help to expand our understanding about how these materials are moving through ecosystems. Um, this study uh, was actually looking at California wastewater treatment plants um, and identifying, as with many other studies, that uh, wastewater, modern wastewater treatment plants is actually, that process is actually a great way to capture um, microfibers. Um, uh, they become part of the biosolids that are captured and removed before the effluent is let out of the wastewater treatment plant. There's really only about 5% in this study that they found, but you know, anywhere from five to I think 10% of fibers actually getting out of, or um, be, as an output from the, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the problem here being we here in California look at biosolids as this great nutritional source that we can then put back out on agricultural lands, um, land apply these biosolids because they're a great organic, um, uh, organic substance um, to actually help um, restore soil health. Um, but unfortunately, there are these these PFAS chemicals as well as um, fibers also still um, bonded and within these biosolids. So here in California, actually 74% of the biosolids captured were, were put out on, um, on, on terrestrial environments, 17% went to landfills and 3% uh, went to incinerators. So it's just something for us to think about. Um, you know, we, uh, the original thought was apparel washing was this huge source and pathway um, for microfibers getting out into our waterways, but air deposition as well as, um, uh, you know, 
secondary pathways like land application of biosolids are also an important source and pathway to think about. In the 2022, so last year, report on microfibers, um, the invisible pollution from textiles, this graphic was produced with the most relevant and recent estimates for textile use. Um, the main thing I wanted you to get across here is on the right, um, they actually talk about textile manufacturing and the estimate there. And if you look directly left where it says textile use, which covers us as consumers, where we're laundering, um, whether it's residential or commercial, um, and also just general wear and tear. So textile use, what we do, and textile manufacturing, what industry has control over, um, are pretty equal estimates. So in other words, textile industry has a huge role to play, not only in how they design the garment for us to wear, um, but also um, what they can do along the textile manufacturing pro uh, processing line, in addition to materials choice, obviously. Um, so what can industry leaders do to reduce their microfiber footprint? Well, in the recently released Tackling Microfibers at the Source uh, report by Forum for the Future, it was no surprise, at least not to me, that um, wet processing stages of textiles, so dyeing, washing, finishing, those were the biggest source of microfiber release. One of the key recommendations they provided was to work upstream with textile manufacturers to implement, so brands could work upstream with textile manufacturers to implement more robust wastewater treatment. Um, in some cases, there is not any wastewater treatment depending on um, the, the brand's existing sustainability uh, expectations with, um, with their upstream partners. So that's something that definitely needs to be in place. Um, but as we learn about more best practices in wastewater treatment here regionally and locally we can also cross share that with our textile manufacturing and vice versa um, they also recommended to invest in low impact or new types of coloration coloration technologies dry processing things like digital printing or sublimation printing um, using supercritical CO2. The, we've been dying, Amy and I were talking about this two days ago, we've been dying things the same way for hundreds of years, and we can really think more about how to use less water in the process or maybe no water at all, um, because we are so reliant on that as a resource. And in the case of textiles, that is a lot, that agitation, um, that processing is a lot of where fibers are released in textile manufacturing. Uh, industry leaders can also fund research like the microfiber sample kit that I had mentioned earlier to support our understanding of microfiber toxicity and come up with that biodegradability and toxicity criteria or initiatives like pictured here, the No Trace Trails group um, uh, to better understand the prevalence in places we think are protecting national and state parks you know, that we think we are protecting, but we still see impacts. Um, industry leaders can also get involved in policy, like this policy bill proposed in California requiring washing machines in California to get filtration. I think Oregon has some policy similar um, that's on the docket as well. Uh, it, this is also cost and energy efficient and has the potential to dramatically reduce microfiber pollution. And then of course, brands can invest in renewable, regenerative um, and recycled fiber systems. Um, I wanted to highlight a project um, or a coalition we've been working on with Rebecca Burgess of Fibershed, Lauren Tucker of White Buffalo Land Trust and Lauren Bright of Taurus Circularity, that's the leadership team and a, a large group of brands uh, textile manufacturers and um, soil service providers all working together to um, develop textile and product systems that actually improve soil health. And when you improve soil health, you improve soil water holding capacity, you don't need to use as much water, you can um, actually ride through things like atmospheric rivers um, because the soil can actually contain some of that water versus a lot of conventional agriculture today where we are depleting our soils. Um, this is an awesome group to check out, um, but the, the main point being here, really reinvesting in natural fiber systems, divesting from fossil fuel based 
um, the 60 plus percent that we are as a fashion industry um, committing to synthetics today really get off of that um, and then also thinking about where dyes come from as well. Um, and then finally, brands and industry leaders can connect with existing work streams. There's a great group out of the UK, the Microfiber Consortium, who is collating a giant data portal that will have, that's, um, they're testing all these different textile constructions, yarn construction, looking at manufacturing processes to better understand how we can design textiles differently um, to reduce microfiber pollution. Um, and then also you can um, check out our experiencing experiential learning events if you're in the California area. Um, April 14th, we're bringing fashion students out from the California College of Arts to learn about material flow pathways and intervention points. Um, in September, we're planning an overnight sale around the Fairlawns with the Five Gyres uh, Institute to discuss impacts on microfiber pollution and workshop with a cross-sector group. And then finally, our October 13th sale, which is um, open for anyone who wants to join. It's our second annual textile times ocean connector sale, um, where we bring uh, folks from the ocean side, from the textile side, to all discuss these critical issues that I mentioned before on a boat in the San Francisco Bay, a giant tall ship. Um, it's a really fun event, uh, and uh, we always hear about really exciting collaborations that come out of these events. Um, Please do reach out if you're interested in sponsorship, attending the events, um, working with us on um, any of these topics that we discussed. Uh, so I'm gonna leave you, cause I, I know I'm just a little bit over time, Amy, um, with just the following questions. What materials legacy do you wanna leave? Uh, can we design a blue material world together? So now I'll hand it over to Kathy and Amy just to give a few comments around the role of natural dyes because both of them are really the experts around natural dyes um, and how they connect to these critical water issues. Um, I know we want to also make sure there's time for questions. So I'll let Amy guide us through the rest. Thank you all. Thank you, Crystal. That was, wow, so thought provoking. I have a half page of notes <laughs> many, many questions. Um, I'm just going to really quickly jump in and talk a little bit about um, what, you know, when we look at natural dyes and the use of water and how can we be more water uh, conscious and what are some of the strategies that we can um, use in order to really be mindful about our water use. Um, definitely, there are many, many um, references and articles on our website and blog, but there's just some very basic things. We are still using mainly the um, old fashioned immersion dyeing type technology. Um, so in that context, what we're looking at are things like reusing dye baths, reusing mordant baths, um, looking at your rinse water, uh, you know, as you rinse things, can you reuse that rinse water for another use? Um, there's ways that you can dispose of dye baths in order to use it as an irrigation for gray water um, type applications. You can also, of course, create pigments and paints from the residue that's in your dye bath in order to help decolorize the dye bath so that it can be disposed or reused. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways of doing that. You can also have a dye practice that focuses on painting and printing as opposed to immersion dyeing. That's a lower water use. Um, I was also at a textile lab that focuses on natural dyes and they were showing me something that they call waterless printing, um, which is of course dyeing with basically if you will print an entire uh, length of cloth with a solid color, you're essentially dyeing it with a waterless technology. So they were experimenting with those types of techniques to see if they could also address this issue of actual water consumption. Um, Amy has been working night and day, day and night on wastewater. And so um, Amy, maybe you have a few words to say about that and then we can open it for questions. 
Ooh, I have a lot to say about wastewater, especially when we're at the wastewater treatment plant and the number one thing you can do, like when we go down there on Fridays, I guess, I, I haven't been to this actual event, but Brian, who I work with, they go and unclog this pipe on Fridays. And the number one thing that's clogging the pipe is clothing. People are actually flushing their clothing, not just the microplastics, but people are actually flushing clothing down their toilets. And some I'm sure are getting into through the gutters and drains and roads and stuff too but i think that's really interesting but um and flushable wipes flushable, flushable wipes. wipes yeah that's those are <laughs> which are not wipes. flushable at all they should be, all of be illegal to say <laughs> yeah it really is um so i have lots of lots of thoughts on wastewater but because i want to jump into some of these questions the one thing i do want to say to both of you it's, uh, it just popped into my head. When we think about waterless dying, as I always say to people in sustainability, you really need to pick your poison in whatever you're in whatever piece you're under the sustainability umbrella, because you can absolutely do waterless printing with toxic chemicals and toxic color. So you have sure. you're not using water, but you're using really um you're using synthetic dyes in most synthetic cases. dyes. So, yep. so where's is, that origin? Is, you know, in that which will eventually come into the water. So you have to really start thinking about what is it that I most want to do when I talk about water or talk about dying and really like laser focus in on that and try to be better at it. As natural dyers, I put this link, I put I think 10 or 12 ways that we can be better at using water as part of our natural dying. And those are just easy tips, the putting rain barrels up. I mean, Madeline, who I'm looking at right now, I see you, uh, Madeline came on and did a feedback Friday on, on water and the impact of water on some matter experiments, which is completely, she, she's doing many more experiments as well. And there's lots of different ways you can get water. So you have to be creative and pick your poison and realize that Natural dyeing is not the best thing in the world, but neither is uh, waterless printing. It's just like, what, where are you doing what you're doing? How can you conserve? How can you use less? How can you keep recycling? How can you, for us, evolve your clothing? I mean, I have an Eileen Fisher shirt on that was, that Kathy dyed as part of the Indigo collection. They're releasing next month. And it's a gently worn Eileen Fisher silk top that was gently warm, but now it's this awesome blue silk top that I have on. So think about evolving your clothing too. Okay, I'm gonna jump into some questions if it's okay. Yes. Are you ready, Crystal? I am. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, so- And I did, do, before we go there, I did just wanna mention, you know, the, the role of wastewater treatment and uh, thinking of a textile manufacturer as a closed loop process. There are some more modern uh, textile manufacturers that actually reclaim their water. They treat it well enough to then reuse it again. So to your point, um, maybe it's not moving to supercritical CO2 as a vehicle to dye materials um, because we're thinking about the input chemistries and the energy involved, um, but that we are also thinking about this important role of treatment of what goes in and what goes out, not just saying, oh, I'm gonna go produce in Vietnam because their regulations are different than this country. And that allows me to um, just have an output that I don't have to think about. I'm meeting that country's regulation. Um, we know now it's not just hazardous chemistry, it's also um, fibers, uh, fibers that we're treating um, that are getting out into the world and impacting organisms uh, and healthy living systems. Yeah, wastewater is truly, I mean, the work that I'm doing, I'm growing natural dye plants in wastewater and in, in different types of wastewater. And as part of a fiber shed grant, I'm actually focusing on urine diversion and using urine as a fertilizer for plants, which is nothing new. There's other projects doing this, but we want to see, you know, we don't want, we don't want all these chemicals. We don't want all the plastic particles and people's pee going back onto the land, which then goes back to the water. So it's a real study and, and looking at that, but there's, there is actually lots of potential for wastewater to completely change the fashion and textile industry in way like more ways than one 
beyond fertilizer. But and that word waste. I mean, I think yeah, that's part yeah, of the I know. problem, right? It's, waste. Nu it's nutrient water. You know, nutrient filled plus so maybe abundant. You don't want <laughs> it's a resource. Water. <laughs> it's a resource. Yeah. It, it's a resource. Yeah. It's getting people to reframe it and think about it in that way as well. Okay. Um, so somebody was asked, there, two people had asked about, well, it seems that all the ultralight clothing and gear for through hiking are all synthetics. How can hikers be educated about their purchases? I put a couple links in there. There were some things I found, but. All right. We've got through hikers, huh? Um, <laughs> you should definitely check out, check out no trace trails. Uh, so I did spend a lot of my career in the outdoor industry. Um, what I can tell you, if you haven't discovered wool as a base layer, um, I highly recommend it. It works in many different climates um, and uh, conditions. I know it's not as durable as uh, what the polyester and nylons of the world, um, but it works really well. And um, thankfully, this community is really great at mending as well. So you could maybe find a resource and support there. Um, I would highly recommend we are in this shift right now. One of the key things with outdoor gear to av um, avoid is PFC finishes, uh, water and stain repellents that are used commonly on these items. We are seeing some brands in the outdoor industry shift shifting and actually reporting that on their website. So you can actually look for the PFC free treated outdoor apparel. Um, just to avoid having that in our uh, when we wash it or when we wear it out in the outdoors, if you can move to the alternatives and um, or buy something that and or not use something that has um, that water or stain repellent unless you need it. Um, that's one of the most important green chemistry principles is asking, do we need it? Um, and yeah, I think hemp is also a really great material that's thankfully coming back from a domestic uh, production thought perspective. It's another world that we're living in and thinking about how we can build that system here with regenerative agriculture in mind. Um, and hemp is a little bit more durable than cotton. So hemp and cotton blends can perform better than a traditional cotton uh, in some cases. I mean, obviously this depends on yarn and textile construction, um, but I am seeing the outdoor industry shift into that because um, they are being targeted in a lot of ways uh, with this microfiber pollution issue. Um, with Patagonia having the original research that told us over 300,000 fibers per load on your synthetic fleece are being emitted um, to just a lot of awareness and interest and in, from those brands because they know they want folks to play in the outdoors and they don't, they don't want to hurt the outdoors. So they're really thinking about material choices and what's next. And after that Patagonia study, of course, they um, they continue to make those plastic fleece jackets that are their top selling. I've got to throw it in, but um, and I know Laura Sullivan's here. They're not the only ones. I know they're not the only ones. <laughs> they're definitely everybody likes a Patagonia fleece pullover. Um, there's uh, the Northern New England Fiber Shed is having a round table next month, and I'll be speaking on waste. We'll have water waste, textile waste, and wool waste. But Laura Sullivan, who's on here, um, is also will be talking about hemp and her work with the University of Vermont growing hemp. If people are interested in May, come say hi in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, Sounds awesome. It's going to be awesome. How can one be more mindful with their daily fiber uses in the home environment to mitigate or reduce microplastic pollution? Yeah, great question. Um, Generally, there is quite a bit of research and um, textile care. So um, washing less, I think um, the average American washes 10 loads a week. Um, and before having a baby, I didn't understand that. I think I would save my laundry until, you know, every three weeks. But so washing clothing less, um, washing on cold, um, and, and delicate or um, permanent press, you know, that medium setting as opposed to always going sturdy uh, to that sturdy setting. Um, just in general, agitating the clothes less when they're wet. Um, uh, also just thinking about your material choices. Um, again, 
us as consumers reinvesting in natural fibers, uh, thinking about those non-woven face wipes that you use every day, if you use them to remove your makeup, you know, that's that's also a textile and a, and a source of fibers. Um, the masks that you use, if you're still wearing masks, um, what clothing you put against your body, uh, the things you choose and use in your closet or choose to purchase, um, really look more towards um, uh, natural fibers, renewable sourced fibers, um, as opposed to the traditional polyester and nylon. And to Amy's point, use what you have, um, the more, and, and keep it mended. So obviously fibers can also be emitted when you've got a hole in your sweatshirt you, and ultimately the thing becomes unusual potentially. Um, so um, yeah, do a little mending and, and keep, up, uh, keep up the quality of your clothing so that it keeps its value over time for you. Um, I think we maybe have time for one or two more questions, but um, so this question is, can you explain further how microplastics are being found in snow? Are they combining with the snow and the atmosphere? Or is it wind incorporated? And how has this very wet winter in California impacted microplastic levels in our waterways and fiber crops? Those are great questions. Um, the pathway the sort of the environmental compartment we don't know a lot about because it's a little harder to test is air and air deposition as a pathway um, because we are finding plastics in the arctic and the antarctic we really have to think about air being likely a deposition pathway um, the snow is is actually a great representation of these fibers are likely in the air um, and being um, as snow is formed because of cold temperatures actually raining down or snowing down onto um, onto our, our land. Um, we five gyres um, and ourselves on this this September sale that we're planning to the Farallons. Um, Lisa Ertel will actually be taking air samples. Um, the Farallon Islands are these this like remote group of islands that no one is allowed to touch. And so taking samples around the air outside of such a high urban area like San Francisco will give us a lot of information around how samples are being moved. Um, another uh, study I know about is outside of Hawaii and the Hawaii Islands, just trying to better understand air deposition as a pathway. Um, as far as what these rain events are going to mean for microplastics. One pathway um, we know a lot about here in San Francisco is um, like urban runoff uh, and sewer overflow. Um, when we have these huge rain events, and that's where a bulk of the microplastics come from, washing off our streets, washing off um, our different urban land, uh, urban land areas. And so I do anticipate that we may have a lot more. I don't know anyone that's studying that per se here in California, but it's certainly something I think would be really interesting because now they're naming these atmospheric rivers like hurricanes. So I, I think we're gonna have to expect them to be the new norm. And so thinking about what does that mean moving forward is super important. Let's see. I was trying to find so many different links too as you're talking. <laughs> Um, you know, I think this is, this is actually maybe a good question. It's not so much a big, ah, it's going to wrap everything up, but somebody was just to keep, as you guys are putting things in, I lose it. Somebody was asking about super washed wool and is super washed wool a pollutant. Uh, so the Percocet process, the process they do to traditionally for superwash wool uses a very, very small amount of halogenated material, chlorine. Um, chlorine is in the same um, section of the periodic table as fluorine. Um, so a carbon chlorine bond is, is tougher to break. Um, generally, I have not seen evidence to show that it's a pollutant, um, but these are the types of questions I think the lens of microfiber pollution will bring to how we treat these materials. Um, one thing superwashing does to wool is remove a little bit of that scale and provide um, a coating for those fibers so that they are easier to wear and wash and um, don't we don't have as much of the entanglement issue, the felting issue. 
um, so you can get these finer yarns um, and uh, the the next to skin base layers that are so um, that are so great to use. Uh, as far as wrapping up, I mean, it, it, I think it is a good question because really through this lens and through the lens of water, thinking about everything that goes into textiles and what happens to it as we're wearing it or what's next, um, that holistic picture of designing for textiles and products is, is what we really need to do moving forward. We can't just think, oh, I'm gonna use plastic bottles from this waste stream over here and call that uh, something that's an ocean bound plastic and call that something healthy that's for the ocean. That's not enough. That's just, that's not the right solution. We need to think about materials going in, chemistry going in um, and um, making more meaningful products and producing less of them. <laughs> so I'll end there. Thank you, Crystal. Thank Crystal, you. Oh my Crystal. God. I know I, I have so many things to ask you, but <laughs> <laughs> I also, I took off for a second and I just wanted to show you, I, I still have my backyard hoodie. Oh, right how special. Yeah, I know. I, I got one of those. Uh, I have two and I'm, one of them's an extra small. I'm waiting for my daughter to fit into. I'm excited. I like this. using it when I do fiber <laughs> shed talks. It's like a, it's a nice thing to talk about how this has been done. So. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to this community. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to continue to explore what natural dyes and their role uh, can do through this lens. So uh, Kathy, Amy, we'll be talking again soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to talk about it. It's great. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks all. all. Right. Thank bye you. Bye. Can unmute and <laughs> say hello. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I know Crystal you. actually had to take off really quickly to get another you. meeting. She had to get oh. to. She was on the. Hey, Kathy, you know, one of the things that we didn't talk about was what's behind you. I bet you people are wondering. Oh, this is a water project that I did. So um, we have a, a monthly wholesale uh, meeting and this month I decided to do water quality. And so um, we had several of the people around our wholesale group who are in different parts of the country send in water samples. So they each sent me a little bottle of water and uh, I dyed the same yarn, same mordant, same amount of dye with their water. And as you can see, we got a pretty interesting range. Um, so this, 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 and this are roughly a similar color, but this is a complete outlier. Um, and so is this one. And so this one was in a region of Massachusetts where the water is generally regarded well, as soft. In certain areas. And then this one is where it is uh, considered extremely hard. Um, so you can kind of see the ring range there. So this was with cochineal. And then the um, other thing I did was yeah, the I, same with, with matter. The and again, will easier is to pull sorry. it down as data. This is than the one that's the soft water. water. And then this one is the one that had really right. super hard water. So you can again see that the the dye, this is matter, the dye really reacted to the water quality. And it was just an experiment we were doing to see what was going to happen if um, we all tried to dye, you know, if I dyed something with everybody's water. So it was pretty interesting to do that. I've also done this type of experiment where people would send in their dye plants. And so we would dye, everyone would, we'd either distribute yarn and people would dye with their own dye plant in their own water. And then we would reassemble it and see what the um, study was about. So Madeline, that's probably something that we could, <laughs> I saw you raise your hand, but I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I had muted people because I didn't know where that was coming from. Oh, there. 
It wasn't me, I swear. Uh, <laughs> um, can I just ask a question about the samples? Yeah. The really hard water sample, it's from somebody's well? Or it's from like- um, It's actually from, um, it's, not, it's not tap water. It's actually from Alum Rock Park, oh. which is the park. It's in San Jose <laughs> in the East Foothills. And it's the park that I grew up going to pretty much every single day as a kid. Um, so to play like and it's got water? mineral springs. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a. It's interesting though. No matter what, like with um, the colors that you got, Kathy. That there's, you know, when we talk about here's the recipe, like Kathy will give, but it'll always it could always be different because of what your water is like. So it's but yep. it's, so it's interesting to see depending on that. And then you were giving tips during that wholesale meeting too, of ways that you could help to balance that as well. So you could get that color that you really do want to get that like certain red or that deep, the deep red of both colors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Amy, it's 10.06. Yes. yes, half Maybe of the people have, have left us. They've gone on to, who <laughs> are they? Fine. Who are, who even are they? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It was a great meeting. I'm going to stop this recording. Yeah. Thank you.